from east to west and kingdom to kingdom, you're listening to the Diz Unplugged Connecting with Walt podcast. Connecting with Walt is brought to you by Dreams Unlimited Travel, experts at helping you plan the perfect Disney vacation. Visit them on the web at www.dreamsunlimitedtravel.com. Hello and welcome to Episode 5 of the Diz Unplugged Connecting with Walt podcast. I am your host and Diz historian, Michael Bowling, and I'm joined by my co-host and producer, Craig Williams. So Craig, how are you this Halloween week? Oh, I'm not bad at all, so just trying to get in the spooky spirit. Spooky spirit. So are you going to have a more of a Disney Halloween or a Universal Halloween Horror Nights Halloween? Uh, you know, it's it's difficult because with work, we typically go to like the Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween party right at the, the start of the year. So we already did that, but then I've been basically going to Halloween Horror Nights every weekend at least once if not twice and also watching a vast variety of uh halloween movies at home too so uh it's it's my halloween skews a bit more on the the graphic gory side but i also enjoy the the disney stuff at that point too Mm -hmm. i usually we're more of disney because i decorate the house up and all the neighborhood children call it the disney house and (laughs) So it's a sort of a combination of sort of eerie and Disney, yeah. And and then I and I play this as Halloween nonstop outside is, and all that. But this year we also every year go to a Halloween party that's um, that's from folks from the Walt Disney Family Museum, and they always do it on the Saturday of Halloween weekend. Well, Halloween's on a Saturday, so we're not going to be home. Oh no! So I didn't so I didn't put out any decorations this year. Oh, that's I don't, sad. I don't want the children that walk up and find nobody here. So, well, did you at least yeah. decorate inside? No, I didn't even do that <sighs> this time around. So, um, see? I know it's it's tough. Yeah, <laughs> being in an apartment, I obviously can't really decorate outside that much. But my inside is well stocked with Halloween horror night stuff. Uh, a lot of a lot of Disney stuff, a lot of the Disney popcorn buckets that you get at the parties, and oh yeah, and then uh, of course all my shrunken zombie head mugs that I have hoarded from Trader Sam's. Yeah, yeah. So I, I decorate with a lot of that stuff too. Yeah, no, it's all perfect. <laughs> yeah. So now, last time we talked about, uh, we both gotten the the Blu-rays of Tomorrowland, and that sort of tied into our first couple of episodes where we talked a little about it and talked about Brad Bird and his presentation at the Walt Disney Family Museum. So, have you watched the Blu-ray um, of Tomorrowland? You know what? I honestly have gotten lazy. Not lazy. I guess I've just been too busy with Halloween uh, movies and such. But no, I, I haven't sat down and watched the movie again since I bought it. But I did go through all of the special features multiple times. So okay. that's I am I am well versed on everything that is on the disc in terms of special <laughs> features in the movie. I, yeah, I, I guess I did watch bits and pieces of it to just to see if like stuff in the special features how it it did sink back up into the movie so mm-hmm. I, I always try to take it that extra nerdy mile yeah. so was there anything that stood out for you on the special features well i mean i know one of the big things that everyone was excited to see in the movie was obviously more of the mentioning of walt disney because it was basically stricken from the actual film itself uh as well as the the uh the extra scene shot with the the world's fair overlay because everyone mm-hmm. uh knew that there there had to be more just based on what they saw like in disney world here uh we knew that they came and filmed at the carousel of progress and then of course get to the movie and it's just missing so i was excited to dive in and actually find those pieces and uh the where they're in the comic store and well the geek store and they really explain Walt Disney's involvement in the whole Tomorrowland in Disney is a kind of a cover like I I, I enjoyed that right. clip just for bringing that in 
And didn't you feel that that scene connected a lot of the film? It absolutely did. It? It, it, I mean, it made sense why It's a Small World was part of the portal and why it was called Tomorrowland and why there were audio animatronics. And, you know, and Brad Bird said, well, we were getting a little too preachy. And I thought that was almost the core of a lot of this film. Yeah, it was. And I think they they absolutely would have been a little more off-putting to to people if they would have left it in because it was very preachy in terms of Walt Disney. But at the same time, too, it was kind of crucial plot points to the entire movie. So um, I, I think that should have been something that was added in as a director's cut and not left as just a, a deleted scene. But hey, at, at the same time, too, they explained once I finally took the time to find the uh, the extended scene of the World's Fair, which wasn't easy because, you know, we had the Blu-ray version. Well, you have to put it in your Disney movies anywhere to watch that extra scene, okay. and you can now, only can, watch it on your devices. Can, now, can you explain how that works? Because I know y- you had to really work at it. Yeah. So um, how do you do that? You just the code that they give you inside the Blu-ray combo pack, or if you just flat out want to buy it from the Disney Movies Anywhere app, um, that will access two extra, uh, two extra deleted scenes. The one being the World's Fair, the World's Fair scene, <laughs> and uh, but yeah. So once you get that code, you have to enter it into your Disney Movie Rewards account, and from there it'll unlock straight into your disney movies anywhere account as long as it's under the same email as your disney movie rewards account and it is overly complicated for something that would have taken up no disc space at all but i guess it does then get people to want to have the incentive to either redeem their digital copy or just buy it via the app and save save the environment without buying any more actual physical copies but at the same time they're already made you might as well just buy the physical copy um but yeah once you get to the clip you know it it did uh it it was cool that you got to see where they shot in carousel of progress and you got a little more uh idea of the scope of the recreation that they made for the world's fair but at the same time uh along with a lot of the clips they cut out they said they did it because of the pacing of the film and that it was ruining the pacing some of them were because they just changed the entire storyline like with um erasing judy greer's character as Mm -hmm. the main character's mother and um all their extended family that was living with them. Yeah, that that was where they really changed the entire story of the film, so that had to be necessarily cut. But for a lot of the um, the little sections that they're just like, oh, it wasn't really, you know, it slowed down the pacing of it, so that's why we took it out. It was literally 30 extra seconds, stuff yeah, that could I, have been left in with no issues at all. Yeah, I think that blast from the past scene where they explain Walt Disney's connection... Um, I think it was just they were afraid that people wouldn't go see this because they would think it was a Disney film. Yeah, and they pulled it out. No, and, and I think that that I I think that hurt the film. What, now was it worth it seeing the Carousel of Progress going to all that effort? The Carousel of Progress scenes was that worth the payoff? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when in terms of doing the whole like movie re- rewards and all that stuff, I already do that because. You know, I, I spend so much money on Disney movies, so then whenever they have Blu-rays in there that I don't currently own, I use all my points to redeem for those. So I, I already do that extra step anyways, but uh, it, it was more of just an inconvenience because this is something I wanted to watch on my TV. I wanted to see this these scenes on the big screen, and I know that I could do that, but at the time that I was doing all of this, you know, I'm already on my phone inputting the code, and then after that, I wanted to watch it right away. So then I'm stuck there watching the scene that I wanted to see on my phone, and you know, it was it was still great. But at the end of the day, it I wish they would have just put it on the freaking Blu-ray yeah. and saved everyone some time. Yeah, but you know, it's all that synergy and promoting other other media. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the world of tomorrow's science hour with futurologist Dave Nix? I loved it. No, yeah. it was. <laughs> I I think the release in general is worth it just for the special features alone. Um, between that 
having that great comedy with Hugh Laurie, I think he is just phenomenal. Um, even though he didn't really get a lot of screen time and his character was very one dimensional in the film. Uh, he's always very pleasant to watch. And, uh, I really enjoyed the special feature with, um, uh, my gosh, Michael Giacano, uh, uh-huh. whenever the day that Richard Sherman came in to watch them record Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, that was worth it alone, just for that one feature right there. Yeah, yeah. And that animated short, The Origins of Plus Ultra, yeah. they probably should have played that before the film <laughs> in the theater. I know, exactly. <laughs> and that yeah. it's so funny because that's an option on the actual disc itself that you can start it just by itself or you can start it with watching the the Plus Ultra short in front of it like it's supposed to be, like it was intended to. So yeah. just, you know, overall, they, they just made a couple mistakes here and there in the, in the release of the film and the marketing for the film. But overall, it's still enjoyable you enjoyed it right oh very much so yeah, yeah I, I think the the more i watch tomorrowland the more i see in it and the more i appreciate in it and now that i've seen that one deleted scene in blast from the past i you know it, it i appreciate it even more yeah i agree so yeah so we we're talking about tomorrow and the future but it's now time for us to go back into the past and in episode four, Craig and I took you on a virtual trip back to 1982 when we toured Epcot City, if it had been built as Walt originally envisioned it. So did you have any more thoughts on that, Craig? We've had a, a week to think about that trip and what we absorb Epcot City. You know what? I actually, um, you know, I've, I've seen the Epcot short before and I should have watched it right before we recorded it, but I didn't. And so then whenever I was editing the show and I went back and, you know, I, we already had recorded the show. I got to watch it with fresh eyes and ears and see it all over again. And honestly, the, the more we talked about it and I was kind of at the end of it thinking how it would have failed, um, just based on it. I mean, we wish it could work, but at the same time, it probably would have done badly and after watching the video again i have to say i still can't ever see that as a possibility of it working so well just because i mean a lot of it comes down to the the short-term living aspects of it it's just and crazy yeah and i know walt played back and forth with that he he started to consider okay extending the time you know long-term leases that for some of the uh, companies that were, you know, in the industrial park or who had invested, their their executives could live in Epcot City as part of maybe like um, year and a half sabbaticals, uh, you know. But still, even that, even going a year and a half, I think it still would have been hard to establish that sense of community. Yeah. There. And the interesting thing is, though, because I I went back and looked at it, too, a lot of what he was proposing in terms of the actual structure already existed. He wasn't doing a lot of technology that was out of this world. Yeah, It was just the way he was putting it together and the way he was organizing it and structuring it is what was so different. But I think he actually could have built Epcot City. It was just if he could overcome some of the political and social structure that uh, that he wanted to overcome exactly and i mean the only other thing that really you can take into play of how would it all worked it would it have worked is like in terms of general maintenance too of it i mean a lot of the actual transportation involved was using monorails or the kind of the uh, the people mover cars if they broke down a lot of the city then would come to a screeching halt exactly and if in some of these uh, industrial park uh, you know partners and sponsors if they started leaving and they couldn't get replacements you know that would affect you know the success of epcot as well exactly so and so, so there was a, a lot of things dependent you know dependencies and a lot of risks in order to make Epcot succeed. 
So, well, in today's episode, The Torch is Passed On, we'll discuss the effect Walt's passing had on the Florida project and how it progressed with his brother, Roy O. Disney, taking the project on as his crusade. So shortly after the rumors of Walt Disney's involvement in Central Florida were confirmed, uh, property values in the area began to skyrocket, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Everyone wanted to build near Walt's project, and and also near the large number of guests it was sure to attract. So Marty Scalar recalled that when they were making plans to go into Florida, Joe Potter said, Walt, I've been down in Florida as your representative, and those people there think you can do anything. In fact, they think you can walk on water. And Walt looked at him, got up, and walked out the door. We could hear his footsteps going down the hall, Marty said, and then we could hear his footsteps coming back. He opened the door, popped his head back in the room, and said, I've tried that. <laughs> Closed the door and left. <laughs> so, a good comeback. Exactly. Now, unlike Disneyland, where all they had to do was start bulldozing trees and start digging, you know, holes for the, you know, furrows for the infrastructure and rivers and all that, they had a huge... Uh, you know, civil engineering job they yeah. had to do with all of the swamp land. And also they had to get, there was a lot of political sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to do compromises yeah. and negotiations that had to go into effect because Disney World was in two different counties, yeah. Orange County and, and Os- Osceola, Osceola County. And they had to be able to govern you know, this vast piece of land and this city that that would stretch over two counties. So, so before anything could be built, Disney had to work to get its regulatory package through the state legislature. And the project ran into its first political challenge very quickly. On November 2nd, 1965, Floridians voted against a proposed $300 million bond issue for roads. And a large portion of the bond issue would have gone towards highway and access improvements for Central Florida. And this was going to be critical for the success of Disney World, since all the company's forecasts projected a large drive-in visitor base. So estimates indicated over 80% of guests would arrive by automobile. So the company had to ensure there was adequate road infrastructure to handle these guests. You know what? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was wondering, is that true today? Is Are most visitors, they're going there by auto? Oh, I, absolutely not. I mean, now it's it's all planes. That's why our airports keep getting busier and busier and busier. And especially because a lot of our tourists that come in now, uh, which is very evident to see whenever you're walking around theme parks in central Florida is there's a very strong uh, foreign market coming in from South America as well as also even, uh, you know, we get our random Europeans, mostly uh, people from England, but uh, definitely the South American market has really taken over and uh, it's really easy for them to to get flights into Miami and Orlando so I guess I guess some of them will drive up from that way but no it's it's all about uh, it is all about air travel around Central Florida however uh, if you've never been here before and for the people who have you also realize that the airport isn't just simply right outside of property like Walt wanted it to be like right on the edge of their property and then take them up in uh, MCO is a solid 20 minute drive all the way uh, from Disney property or Universal property or really any of the attractions right in that area and um, no one seems to know how to drive on I-4 <laughs> so you know you have two ways essentially to get uh, to the airport from Disney property or vice versa and that's 417 which is the easier way that's the road that Disney ended up eventually uh, funding essentially so they could have Magical Express uh, traveling to and from the property a lot easier as well as just anyone who wanted to access Disney property easier and then also you have 528 which is what connects into I4 and although it can be easy to get to property 
you know, especially like downtown Disney area, it's easy to get there using 528 to I-4. It still can be a nightmare because of traffic. Um, there, there's one thing out there for Floridians. They, they really don't know what's good for them in terms of uh, in improving highways and just traffic and roads in general. They just don't get it. And, you know, now we're going through the big I-4 expansion right around downtown Orlando, and that's really starting to kick up now. And, uh, you know, we'll get a taste of a lot of these improvements that needed to come a long, long time ago. So now... Well, this was so important that immediately after the bond was defeated, Governor Burns met with Disney officials who were in Florida at the time, and the goal of this meeting was to develop another strategy for the needed highway infrastructure. So Governor Burns uh, even traveled to California to meet with Walt about how to move forward after the unexpected defeat of the bond. So another issue facing the project was its tax status. Um, Most of the land Disney had purchased was being taxed at a lower agricultural rate since it was undeveloped. And the company needed the property to remain taxed at the agricultural level until it opened instead of until construction begins. Um, Taxation at the lower rate for the estimated five years of construction would result in a significant savings for the company. So in November 1965, members of Disney's legal team met with the local tax and government officials of both Orange and Osceola County, and the parties reached an informal agreement. Now the company could begin preparing a legislative package to submit to the Florida State Legislature. And before going to the state legislature, the company needed to establish a drainage district to manage water control for the property. Now, General Potter was in control of the land management and development phase of the project. So based on his involvement supervising the Panama Canal Zone, um, Potter knew that if the company didn't officially control the infrastructure uh, and engineering process, the project would become entangled in a regulatory gridlock. Yeah. So this idea of control appealed to Disney officials. So in March of 1966, the company petitioned the Circuit Court of the Ninth Judicial District to create the Reedy Creek Drainage District. And after a court hearing, uh, Disney's application for a new drainage district was improved. So this approval allowed Disney to begin the process of draining and reclaiming much of the land so actual construction would be possible. Yeah, and it's just a brilliant move on their part to do that. So it's still paying off for them till this day. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's amazing just what they had to do before they could even break ground on building anything. I know. I, I can't so, even imagine. Yeah. So the first task of the Reedy Creek Drainage District was to develop methods for draining areas of swampland without damaging the balance of the fragile water tables and avoiding the ever-present danger of flooding. Um, Most of central Florida basically sits on, uh, it floats on a body of fresh water. So any depletion or damage to one part of this water supply uh, could cause environmental imbalance and destruction to the entire region. So after extensive planning, 55 miles of canals and levees were constructed to control and exchange water levels without depleting the overall reserve. Now, being a military man, Joe Potter originally designed the canals to be straight, and it looked artificial. But Walt Disney and Imagineer John Hench wanted the canals to appear natural, like rivers that had always been there. So Joe Potter redesigned the intricate network of canals to follow um, the curves of the natural landscape. Hmm. So now water control structures keep the water levels in check by automatically floating open when the water level peaks and then automatically closing when those peaks subside. So this means the gates don't have to be monitored and they remove the risk of flooding or drought. Now, the self-congratulation in establishing the drainage district was short-lived. Disney was faced with several legislative problems out of their control 
each of which could have derailed the Disney World project. So in June of 1964, as part of an ongoing lawsuit, the United States Supreme Court ordered the Florida legislature to reapportion its state house and senate districts. So in 1965, the state legislature responded by adopting a new reapportionment plan. However, the United States Supreme Court overturned the plan. So in 1966, Governor Burns called a special election in March to set new legislative districts, and the governor wanted Disney to include its legislative package in the special session. Uh, But the company declined because its final plans were incomplete. So this created a significant problem for the Disney company. Um, Because of the reapportionment, the company did not know who would be in the legislature when it submitted its legislative package. So Disney was forced to consult with current legislators on the package and hope they would still be in office after the reapportionment. Jeez. (laughs) and so they were they didn't quite have the control they would have liked no not at all yeah. so the next surprise for disney came during the april 1966 democratic primary election when miami mayor bob hyde defeated governor burns burns had been an ardent supporter of disney and their plans from the very beginning And yet, in another surprise in the November general election, the Republican candidate for governor, Claude Kirk, defeated Mayor High and became the first Republican governor of Florida since 1872. I mean, that was the Reconstruction era. Oh, yeah. So so it had been a while. Just a little bit of time. (laughs) Yeah. So this meant Florida now had a Republican governor and a Democratic majority in the Florida House and Senate. So Disney was concerned this would lead to legislative gridlock just when they were getting ready to submit their unique legislative package. However, they'd invested way too much in the project to stop now based on only possible problems. So the decision was made to continue moving forward with the project. So the Disney company tried to be creative in the financing of the Florida project. Uh, During the November 15th, 1965 press conference announcing the Florida project, Roy Disney was asked if he felt confident about obtaining financing for the project. Roy stated that with the success of Disneyland, bankers realize what we can do. So for a short time, Disney looked into the possibility of obtaining some financing through President Lyndon Johnson's A Demonstration Cities and Metropolitan Development Act of 1966. This was later changed to be called the Model Cities Act. And the program was administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. And the goal of the program was to revitalize large slum and blighted areas of American cities. But what caught the attention of the Disney company was the goal to promote the application of new and improved technologies and methods of constructing, rehabilitating, and maintaining housing and the application of advances in technology to urban development activities. So Disney had Buzz Price's company, ERA, prepare a report on the best way to obtain federal funding and a report concluded Walt would have to surrender a level of control to meet the federal reporting requirements. And, well, we know by now this was something Walt would not accept. Yeah, and while technically speaking from the wording that you just read off, yeah, it they could have probably found funding based on it in that way, but... I mean, just going back to knowing the actual goal of the program, revitalizing slum and blighted areas of American cities. I, I'm only so familiar with how Florida was at the time, Central Florida. I don't think it, even at that point in time, though, you could really call it large a large slum or blighted area of uh, American city <laughs> there. So might have been a struggle. But actually, they did have local legislatures and the governor really pursued this. Huh? And they were getting a tentative approval wow. from HUD for this, but it was that whole issue of the federal reporting yeah. and how open they were going to have to be and that the government was going to be able to dictate 
some of the things that they were going to have to do in the construction and running of Epcot. And, you know, Walt just wouldn't have any of that. Yeah. I mean, for the better, obviously. So as all the Florida political turmoil of 1966 came to an end, the project would encounter something it might not be able to recover from. The death of the genius and inspiration behind the project. In April 1951, Walt and Roy's uncle Robert turned 85, and Walt wrote him in a note, Longevity seems to run with the Disneys on both sides of the family. In another letter a month later, Walt wrote, My heart and other vital organs, along with the history of my ancestry, all indicate that I am going to live a long life. Despite the Disney family longevity, Walt had health issues for most of his adult life, and by the mid-1960s, Walt was slowing down. In the 1930s, Walt suffered a nervous breakdown due to the stress of running his growing movie studio. And his doctors suggested Walt take up an athletic activity to help relieve the stress. So after attempting a few sports, he settled on polo. And that was a game that was popular amongst the Hollywood elite at the time. And during one particularly aggressive game, a Walt was hit by a polo ball and knocked from his horse. And this resulted in four of his cervical vertebrae being crushed. And it was thought Walt could make a full recovery, but he never received medical attention for the injury. So over the decades, calcium deposits formed in the vertebrae, causing them to become increasingly painful. And by the final years of his life, he took a massage and a Scott mist at the end of every day. And these issues were made worse by a sinus problem so severe, he had to regularly have his sinuses drained to relieve the pressure. And Walt's weight began to bother him as well, and his rasping cigarette cough was almost constant. Walt's face had become pasty and pale, and the television cameraman tried to disguise obvious aging by blurring his on-screen image. And Walt did not agree with this. I feel it is definitely wrong to photograph me with gauze filters. If I cannot stand being too close to the camera, then have them move back somewhat, but no more filters. You know what? That's whenever I was watching the Epcot, uh, the Epcot video. It just, it despite all of his health problems and knowing how close he was to the end there, and hearing about it, hearing the the stories about how he had to have oxygen between takes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just, I mean, you know that it just shows how much of a professional he was and how much of a professional run organization they also had behind it because i i mean maybe it's just the blind optimism that a lot of us get whenever we watch walt that we kind of ignore any signs like that but even still watching it back i couldn't i couldn't tell that that was a man who was dying soon right right especially if you look at the um uh, the press conference at mineral king Mm -hmm. when you see that it's a marked difference yeah between him and this one and this uh, film, but uh, yeah, Walt, it, it t- filming that Epcot film took a lot out of Walt. Yeah, and like you said, there were frequent takes. He had to t- be administered oxygen and, and all of that. But yeah, he pulled it off. But you know, throughout childhood, Walt's sister Ruth was always impressed with um, how very gritty Walt was. Um, how you'd never know from him that he was hurt. So, true to form, uh, Walt rarely complained even now. Um, In fact, he really didn't like to dwell on sickness or death, um, his own or anyone else's. Uh, We've and we talked about this, and I think when we talked about the PBS uh, um, special that they did on Walt, that he never went near Forest Lawn Memorial Park, where his parents were buried. Um, He stayed away from funerals. Even when his brother Herbert passed away in 1961, he didn't go to the services. Uh, His daughter Diane remembered, Dad was scheduled to go to an Air Force base that afternoon, and Ron Ron went with him. And I remember standing by the grave, and I saw a plane overhead, and I've always thought it was Dad. Hmm. So now Walt began to put his financial affairs in order. When I'm up in heaven playing the harp, 
I really couldn't put my heart into it if I thought I had left things in a mess down here, Walt wrote to Roy in May 1963. Now, Walt may have been slowing down physically, but he was involved in more projects than ever. He surrounded himself with books and articles about city planning for Epcot. He continued to be involved in his television show and the film studio. As often as he could, Walt played with his growing family of grandchildren. Walt and Lillian traveled extensively, often with his daughter Sharon and her husband Bob. They visited England so Walt could research the Disney ancestors and to San Francisco for the 1964 Republican Convention. Besides Epcot, Walt leased land in California to create a $35 million ski resort called Mineral King, and I did a full episode on Mineral King on our Disneyland show. Um, He worked with people in Marceline about purchasing land, including his old family farm, to create Walt Disney's Boyhood Home, a nonprofit tourist site that would help Marceline's economy. We talked about that in an earlier episode. Yes. Yes. Um, He personally supervised the design of New Orleans Square in Disneyland, and he oversaw the redesign of many of the old Disneyland attractions, including the Jungle Cruise, which was reimagined to replace realism with humor. And one of his favorite projects was his idea for a new kind of university education for creative people to be called the California Institute for the Arts, or Cal Arts. The Chouinard Art Institute, which had trained Disney artists for years, merged with the Los Angeles Conservatory of Music in 1962. And Walt had been contributing to the financially challenged Art Institute, as well as personally assisting the founder, Mrs. Nelbert Chouinard, for years. So with the merger, Walt and Roy saw an opportunity to start a university that would educate students in all facets of the arts, dance, music, drama, painting, film. Students would appreciate all forms of art. And Walt told the press, those who can will pay. Those who can't will get scholarships. We want people with talent. So Walt had many ideas for making his school different from any before it. For example, closed-circuit televisions would connect dance floors with painting rooms, um, and this would enable artists to draw ballerinas at work. Um, Walt wanted to have artists like Salvador Dali and Pablo Picasso spend three months at the school as guest professors. Walt was even considering teaching there himself. Hell, maybe I could teach class there, he told Disney artist and Imagineer Mark Davis. Davis appeared a bit surprised when he heard that, and Walt frowned. I don't mean to teach drawing for God's sake, but I'm a damn good story man. I could teach story. (laughs) (laughs) And he could. (laughs) Yes, he could. Um, And Harrison Buzz Price remembered he wanted to build that school. It was the most pervasive objective in a man's mind that I've ever run into. He was very close to the evolution of Cal Arts. He was passionate all the way. Walt said, this is the thing I'm going to be remembered for. On the last day I ever saw him, we had a board meeting on which he presented Cal Arts in model form. Then he took me and Lulu Mae Von Hagen, she was on the board of trustees, and handed me a box full of all the reports I had written, which had been stored under his desk. He looked at the two of us and said, look after my school. I think he knew he was doomed. I have never welched in the 36 years I've served on its board. I never even thought of leaving the school. And, and Buzz Price served on that school until he passed away. Oh, yeah. On that school's board. Well, I mean... So, you know, it, it's just kind of weird to think about, too, as much as I can't ever foresee Disneyland going away or Disney World. But there's, in terms of everything he's done, Cal Arts is, ascend- I mean, it is an institution. All you have to do is think about the people that are alumni from there. Uh, you know, we all know that John Lasseter Pete Docter, uh, Andrew Stanton, Brad Bird, all of them there, uh, including tim burton even but right. it goes beyond that even to today like allison brie um 
from Community and Mad Men. She's an alumni there of theater, uh, and it just so much more. Sophia Coppola. Uh, it's the list goes on and on and on of people who have come out of this school, and you know, more people are going to keep coming out, and you know, it all goes back to Walt. Yeah, and the design of that campus was another glimpse into what Walt was planning for Epcot. He designed that whole campus, and it, again, it was just as we talked about how the Burbank Studio, Disneyland's 1967 Tomorrowland, those were all sort of testing grounds for Walt and his designs for a city, yeah. and create and um, Cal Arts was also that as well. I mean, it's a beautiful campus, the way it's laid out. And th- that was the last great thing Walt really designed before he was going to design Epcot. I mean, just think about it. We wouldn't have A113 in anything, Pixar, <laughs> if it wasn't for Cal Arts. That's true. So, That's true. it's. I mean, it's a legacy right there. Absolutely. Yeah. It definitely is. So... Now, Walt was always building towards something new or better. This point in his life, he was now compared with Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, men who had given the United States of America its unique shape and form. There were those who called Walt an egomaniac. They believed he promoted his name and reputation for its own sake, but it wasn't that way at all for Walt. In 1965, Marty Scalar, who is, we know is one of Walt's writers and Imagineers, um, approached Walt about an idea for the corporate annual report. He had written biographies of a number of people who worked for Walt to demonstrate that the Disney organization was made up of more than just one man. I don't want to do this, Walt said, and I'll tell you why. Walt Disney is a thing, an image that people have in their minds. And I spent my whole life building it. Walt Disney the person isn't that image necessarily. I drink and I smoke. And there's a whole lot of other things that I do that I don't want to be a part of that image. I'm not Walt Disney anymore. Yeah, and that's, that's true to this day. Uh, mm-hmm. Even though, you know, us Disney fans out there, especially the ones who are listening to this, we we know about Walt Disney's drinking and we know about his smoking. It's It's out there, but... You know, even we have to push some of that stuff to the side and think about the Walt that we see on TV, that Walt Disney, the Walt Disney we read about in books, the good Walt. Right, yeah, and, and Walt wasn't a heavy drinker at all. Yeah. But, but he enjoyed his cocktail at the end of the day, which also really was a, a, an attempt to kill the, the constant yeah. chronic pain he was in. But but the interesting thing is when uh, Carol and I went to a presentation a few years ago at the Walt Disney Family Museum by his grandchildren, the grandchildren who were old enough to remember Walt, mm-hmm. so the younger ones weren't there. And one of the things they talked about was, was Walt, the grandfather, the same as, you know, Walt, the uh, the man that we saw on TV? And they said, what we saw on TV was the grandpa they knew. Yeah. And um, and they said, actually, when they saw him on TV, they would go up and kiss the TV, hmm. you know, because they'd, they'd be kissing their grandpa. It's adorable. And, yeah, and they, they had wonderful stories about, you know, that you, when they came over and, you know, Walt had his office set up where there were, there were big windows looking out onto the lawns of the house and even at Smoke Tree Ranch so that, and he would leave the windows open so when the grandchildren were out there playing, he could hear them. But, but And he always had scripts. He was always reading a script or something. But when the grandchildren came over, he put the scripts aside mm. and, and played with them and gave them his time. So, um, so see, he had, he had a good work-life balance, yeah. you know, even back then. So Awesome. Anyway. So on New Year's Day 1966, Walt was the Grand Marshal of the Tournament of Roses Parade. And surrounded by beautiful girls marching bands, and fragrant floral floats, he smiled and waved at the crowds. He would not live to see New Year's Day 1967. 1966 was pretty much like any other year for Walt. Walt spent his mornings at the studio, which was working on The Happiest Millionaire and the animated feature The Jungle Book. Most afternoons he was at WED, planning Epcot and Disney World. Roy talked about wanting to retire, he was 72 years old, 
Walt once again talked Roy out of it. He needed his older brother for the grand projects that were in the works. Walt had his boyhood town of Marceline, Missouri on his mind. In late May, Walt do donated an attraction from Disneyland, the Midgetotopia, to Marceline. It was the only Disneyland attraction ever moved and operated outside Disneyland. And they're in the process of restoring it right now. Yep. In June, Walt and Lillian celebrated their 41st wedding anniversary with Diane and Ron, Sharon and Bob, and seven grandchildren, whilst they cruised the islands near Vancouver, Canada, aboard a huge yacht they had rented. Diane recalled her father as being unusually calm on the trip. He didn't complain about the pain he was obviously feeling. For peace and quiet, he'd go to the top deck and sit there in the wind. He had on a windbreaker and he'd read his books about city planning. Now, in my series, 60 Years of Disneyland on the Dis Unplugged podcast, Disneyland Edition, I describe the events in the last few months of Walt's life in the July 12, 2015 episode titled Dixieland and Pixie Dust. And you might want to listen to that episode as a companion to this episode. On Wednesday, November 2nd, 1966, Walt Disney went to St. Joseph's Hospital across the street from the Walt Disney Studio for tests. His x-rays revealed a spot on his left lung. Surgery was scheduled for the following Monday. Walt's secretary, Lucille Martin, remembers that shortly before he went into the hospital, at the end of a work day, Walt sat talking to Tommy and me about Cal Arts and Epcot. Walt was unusually tired, and as he got up, said, Sometimes I just feel like chucking it all. Then he looked over at me and said, But Lucille and her girls need me. That we do, I said, and Walt smiled. I've always cherished his saying that. The results of the surgery were grim. Walt's left lung was cancerous and had to be removed. The cancer had spread to the lymph nodes, and the surgeon predicted Walt had between six months and two years left. Looking back, Diane Disney Miller recalled, One time when he had a kidney stone, he thought he was dying. Of course, it's terribly painful. We came into the hospital room just after he found out it was only a kidney stone, and he said, I'm going to live! Then he picked up the phone, called the studio manager, and said, Get some buffalo and a pony on the ranch for my grandchildren. When he knew he had cancer, however, he kept it to himself. He must have known. Walt spent two weeks recovering at the hospital and returned to the studio briefly in late November. Most employees knew Walt wasn't well. Word had even reached Disneyland cast members in Anaheim. Some sensed death was only a matter of time, whilst others thought Walt would soon be back to his old self again. Some even speculated if Walt were confined to a wheelchair, what sort of a marvelous device he would come up with to get around in. To many of his staff, Walt was the tent pole that could never be hewn down. Actress Suzanne Plachette remembers seeing Walt after his operation. The morning he came out of the hospital, he came onto our set. We were filming Blackbeard's Ghost. He looked so gray and yellow yet still had a sparkle in his eyes. He must have been in terrible pain. I knew it was coming. If you ever seen anybody with cancer, you know that color. Walt said, come out from behind that desk. I want to see if you're wearing a mini skirt. I said, you just want to see my thighs, you devil you. <laughs> Those were the last words we spoke. I gave him a big hug and went home that night and cried and cried. I've never heard that story before. Yeah, yeah. And the funny thing is, it couldn't happen today because the, she would go to HR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. A good point. Yeah. But I just think it's just, I, I, I included that because I just thought it was such a sweet story that just to show how he got along with everyone. Oh, no, that's you know, that's a great story. You know, and that, you know, he was a studio head, but he never came across like that. I mean, that's the one thing you always hear about him. Yeah. He wasn't like, you know, the studio heads of, of you know, Columbia and MGM and, you know, and, and all that. Yeah. So he was just like everyone else. 
Um, Walt's health was failing faster than the doctor had predicted. He was readmitted to St. Joseph's Hospital on November 30th and passed away there on December 15th, 1966, just 10 days after his 65th birthday. His death certificate records record the cause of death as acute circulatory collapse. I remember standing in the hospital hallway right after Walt died, Roy Disney's daughter-in-law, Patty Disney, remembered. And my father-in-law was consumed with grief. I'd never see him cry before that. I put my arm around him and he walked away. He just wanted to be alone. I heard the report on the news, said Walt's sister Ruth. It was said so casually. And then he went right on to the next item. I really didn't know he was going to go, said Lillian. Neither did he. We had a trip planned for him to recover. Walt had kept all news of his illness out of the press, out of fear it would cause Disney stock prices to drop and affect his plans for Cal Arts and Epcot. Now the world mourned. Newspapers, television magazines, all poured out stories of love and grief for a man who had given so much to the world. So, Michael, how much do you remember from that time? I definitely remember this because it was about a year after uh, my Mickey Mouse Club chapter yeah. ended. And it was, uh, you know, I had come home from school and as I, my mother always had, it was tea, but it was, you know, sort of, uh, it was a little different. It was a little more Americanized. But I, I had my tea and all that took off my uniform and I was running out to play. And my mother was trying to tell me something, but, you know, being 10 years old. Yeah. I didn't think much of it, 10, 11. And so I ran out to play, because I was allowed to play a certain amount of time before I had to come in and do my homework. And uh, I there was a little mom-and-pop grocery store down the block on the corner. Mm -hmm. And I ran by, and they had uh, a rack with the, the uh, San Francisco Chronicle and San Francisco Examiner on... Um, you know, on the racks there. And Examiner was the evening paper. And it, and it was, and, and the headlines were Walt Disney um, dead. Mm -hmm. And I just, that just like stunned me when I saw that. And, um, and I, I just ended up going back home. Yeah. And so, um, so it was a shock. I mean, you know, just cause, you know, we no, you know, we didn't, we didn't have any idea that he was ill. Yeah. You know, you, at that age, you just don't think of people passing away, you know, yeah. and all that. So. No, I mean, it's just, we know how important he is to all of us Disney fans, and even just to the world in general. Um, like, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain here and think of any celebrity or well-known figure who's passed away, you know, in the past recent years that you could even really compare to it like i i wonder if like who's come the closest to getting the same morning maybe princess diana that's exactly who i was thinking yeah. of that's princess diana other than that i mean you know i know there was a lot of attention surrounding michael jackson but that wasn't for necessarily good reasons at the same time too so yeah yeah and we saw a lot when robin williams passed away very true very true yeah yeah so the, yeah, there are certain I, I think people in the public that they they touch our lives for some reason. It's either their humor or their uh, you know their accomplishments, or you're able to see a certain fragility in them, and and they work through it, and and they become inspirations and yeah. all that. But yeah, it it was a shock because he was a mainstay. Yeah, you know he I think for my generation and others before mine, he defined childhood. And as I, you know, as I said once to um, Ron and Diane, because, you know, I was on a first name basis with them. Yeah. But I, t I talked with them um, once because I said, you know, you know, Walt sort of set our 
childhood. He defined it. He defined what was appropriate for us. Uh, he, he stimulated our imagination in different ways. And I thought, you know, what would childhood be like today if there was no Walt Disney? Especially now with things like the, the internet that are imposing themselves on children and, and all of the um, reality that that brings in. And, you know, what, what would the standards be? Because even today, when, when they talk about a film or a television show or something, they compare it to, is it, is it the, the, we have a, a movie reviewer who, they, 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 when they write about family films, yeah. they say it's Disney standard and all of that, meaning you can take any, any child to it yeah. and all of that. And what if we didn't have that standard? What would childhood be like? I mean, it's what would you be like? What would I be like? I couldn't even imagine it. It just, it, it's hard to think about it. So much of Walt Disney framed my childhood into, you know, being a teenager into now. It still, <laughs> still impacts us. It impacts me every day of my life. Oh, well, it's, it's, um, your career. I know. Yeah. It's like, yeah, sit and- here looking at everything Disney around me. It's just, yeah. <laughs> It's there. Well, uh, yeah, my study is um, Sorcerer Mickey and um, and also Disneyland, yeah. you know, in it. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's amazing the impact that he has and continues to have. I know. It's going to be interesting with the next generation when we no longer have people who worked directly with Walt, and how is fandom going to change? Yeah, that's you know? a that's a good point. And, yeah. So, um, but anyway, and so anyway, so yeah, Walt had kept, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, news of his illness out of the, you know, press yeah. for fear it would depress stock prices. Interesting thing is, after he passed away, stock prices went up, and that was mainly because the the the, the companies, I mean, investors thought that the company would be sold off, yeah, and and would and and would just be gone. So, and that there would be money to made and money to be made in that. Yeah. So the news shocked the news of his death shocked the world and stunned um, Walt's colleagues. Um, recalling that day, Imagineer Bob Gurr said, "I remember Roger Brogy walked in just before lunch, and he was totally gray, and said, Walt's gone, go home, and walked out. As I walked out the door, the other employees were all silent. No one spoke to each other. It was like." just go home. I remember the day was rather chilly and moist with very heavy smog. I lived in Orange County and that was the longest, most awful drive home. The world had stopped. Um, Animator Ollie Johnston recalls uh, when I was at my desk when Clark Mallory, who was another animator, um, came into my office and said, it just came over the news, Walt Disney's dead. God, all the air went out of me. I went to Frank Thomas and told him, We just kind of looked at each other, and I said, let's go home. About a week later, I remember sitting next to my wife, and I began crying. I put my head in her lap and just cried. Dick Nunes, who was the the director of Disneyland Operations at the time, was driving to work when he heard on the radio that Walt had died. He picked up the phone and called Card Walker and asked, should we not open the park? Card said, I don't know. Let me get back to you. He called back in a few minutes and said, open it. Nunes said, God, Card, I think our people are going to be really upset. Card responded, Lily made this decision, and I'll tell you what she said. Walt would say the show must go on. Nunes got tears in his eyes. When Disneyland opened on the day of Walt's passing, Disney executives were blasted by the press. But Dick Nunes called Van France, who was in charge of the park's training and orientation program, to his office and said, Van, we've got to start worrying about the next training book. That's when they came up with the idea of the traditions concept, so that Walt's words, traditions, and philosophies would go on forever. They had a rough format by the end of the day. So the day Walt died, the show did go on. Walt once said, my greatest reward has been the ability to build this wonderful organization. Leading the group was a man who had willingly spent most of his life in Walt Disney's formidable shadow. 
From the time they formed the Disney Brothers Studio in Hollywood in 1923, Walt was the visionary who dreamed the dreams, whilst Roy had the often thankless job of determining how to finance Walt's dreams and turn them into good business. Early in their lives, Walt and Roy established a mutual bond of affection, protection, respect, and loyalty. And over the years, they had battled over many of Walt's innovations. Not because Roy didn't support Walt's creativity or because he lacked vision. It was because Walt's ideas didn't always come when the company was in a position to financially support those ideas. When Roy believed in a project, as he did with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the new Disney studio in Burbank, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and Disney World, he could be almost as enthusiastic as Walt for the project. Roy never received much public recognition, recognition for his significant and vital work on behalf of Walt Disney Productions, but his brother knew his value. In a conversation with a reporter in the 1950s, Walt said, Roy and I must have a guardian angel. We could never split up like Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. For our younger uh, listeners, they were a very famous comedy duo (laughs) (laughs) back in the 40s and 50s. Roy doesn't know whether it's my guardian angel, and I don't know whether it's his. Walt knew Roy was vital to the success of the company. At the Florida press conference in November 1965, Walt addressed this unique relationship he and Roy had and how it affected the way they handled business. My brother and I have been together in business for 42 years now. He's my big brother, and he's the one that when I was a little fella, I used to go out with some of my wild ideas, and he'd either straighten me out or put me on the right path, Or if he didn't agree with me, I'd work on it for years until I got him to agree with me. Roy was eight years older than Walt and had attempted to retire several times in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Walt did everything he could to oppose Walt's retirement from the company. And Walt knew they were interdependent. He could not achieve his goals without Roy. In the days following Walt's death, the question loomed. Would Disney World be cancelled? The project had just begun. Now, with its guiding spirit gone, it could just as easily be forgotten. When he died, we all said, there goes Disney World, recalled Marvin Davis. Then Roy called a meeting in the main studio projection room, and all the main people who were involved in Disney World were there. I've never heard a more profoundly brave, gutsy speech in my life. He had just buried his brother, and he was giving us all a pep talk. He said, Walt would want us to face this opportunity, and by God, we're going to do it. When we walked out of there, everybody shook hands and said, well, we're going to finish it. At the age of 73, Roy Disney assumed control of the company and vowed the Florida project would move forward. We're going to finish this park, and we're going to do it just the way Walt wanted it. Don't you ever forget it. And I want every one of you to do exactly what you were doing, going to do when Walt was alive. Walt Roy Disney's instructions weren't just directed at the creative planning and financial aspects of Disney World already underway. He also meant the company would need to finalize the Reedy Creek legislative package. Within weeks after Walt's passing, Walt Disney Productions attorney Paul Hellowell was in Orlando to meet with the area's legislative delegates. His goal was to assure them the company remained committed to the Florida project and that Roy Disney had personally assured him the project was on track. Rather than cancel or delay the project, Disney was actively working on the package of legislative bills needed to establish the project. Now that Walt was gone, it was up to his brother, Roy O. Disney, to focus and guide Walt's successors and ensure the completion of Walt's dream. Roy Disney took up the Disney World projects as his personal crusade. And that is where we close our story for now, and where we'll open it once again in January with four more episodes of Connecting with Walt. I'm excited. I am too. leaving on this a cliffhanger. Is... What's going to happen? Are they going to Are they going to build it? I know. What's going to happen with Epcot City? I know. 
So, so this is uh, this is uh, sort of um, you know I have tears in my wine, as Trixie always says, <laughs> because we've had we've really had a great first month. Uh, you know, m- thanks to our loyal listeners, um, we, as. Pete said on the Disney World show, we our numbers have risen to where we are the second most popular Diz podcast, right? You know, just a little behind the Disney World show. And, you know, we have, you know, all of you to thank for that because, you know, you guys have busy lives and busy days and, you know, you have a lot coming at you and to make time for us uh, and to listen to us and to share the show. I mean, it's truly humbling. I mean, we... We feel very fortunate, to, you know, to have you make us a part of your day. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know we already uh, combined between Disney, all the people here in Florida, and then California. We already had four unique shows going up every week. With the Disneyland show putting out three shows a week, ours either putting out one or two, and then to add on one more podcast to all of that, and everyone's adopted it uh, with no hesitation at all either it just means the world to us yes definitely so and we have a lot to do between now and january we there's halloween there's thanksgiving is coming up there's hanukkah christmas kwanzaa dizpalooza i'm and i'm getting married in all this mix somehow that's <laughs> right i don't know how you have time for all I that i don't but <laughs> 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 so anyway so yeah lots of excitement and i i'm sure some of you looked at your calendars and saw that hey there's five fridays in january but you know one of those is january 1st and the diz is normally on its holiday break yeah i mean we during then we'd absolutely love to give you something on january 1st to ring in the new year but i have a feeling that we're going to be celebrating the holidays quite a bit so. yes yes and but we will pre- be preparing the next um, round of uh, of connecting with Walt. So don't forget about us yep. when we're gone. Absolutely. But um, yeah. But anyway. But um, you know, many books, films, articles, interviews, and lectures were sourced for this episode of Connecting with Walt. And and some of these you might want to put on your uh, wish lists for this holiday season. Yep. Um, including Project Future, the inside story behind the creation of Disney World by Chad Denver Emerson, Walt and the Promise of Progress City by Sam Genoway, Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, Walt Disney and Technology by Christian Moran, The Man Behind the Magic, the story of Walt Disney by Catherine and Richard Green, Walt Disney and the Quest for Community by Steve Mannheim, since the World Began, Walt Disney World, The First 25 Years by Jeff Curdy, and Remembering Walt, Favorite Memories of Walt Disney by Amy Booth Green and Howard E. Green. And remember, uh, we will have direct links to all of these books in the show notes page uh, direct to Amazon for your purchasing needs, whether they are brand new books or uh, used copies of it. Mm-hmm. Yes, because some of these are out of print. Yep. And, and well, Craig, but even though connecting with Walt is going on hiatus, we can still be found on the Diz. So where can our listeners find you when they start to miss you? Uh, still at my house, which I will never reveal the location <laughs> for. And, uh, uh, of course, on all the other shows that I'm a part of, every one of them except for the Disneyland show. Um, which... Yeah, we'll have to get you on that so you can just have the whole trifecta or, or whatever we'd call it. Quintetfecta? I, I mean, well, here's the thing. I'll be out there for uh, my honeymoon in December, and, you know, I'm going to take in every uh, last ounce of glory of Fantasmic and the Rivers of America and uh, Big Thunder Ranch. So, you know, maybe you'll want me in for that for some reason. Well, that's Tom yeah. that decides all that. So, but, uh, and, and, no, anyways, I would, I'd love to be on it. I've only been on it uh, once before, I want to say. So, and that was like two or three years ago at this point. But um, uh, other places you can find me, of course, on social media, on Instagram, and on Twitter. I'm Teleclaster on Facebook. I'm Craig Williams. I'm friends with lots of people. Uh, I don't respond to friend requests that often just because they pile in and my strict screening process uh, before I hit the accept is pretty intricate. So uh, if you're waiting a while, don't get 
don't get too over concerned i'm just a busy person and uh then of course also follow all of the actual Diz official uh accounts on facebook twitter instagram as well because a lot of that is some of the work i'm putting into it too and the more work you consume that i do uh the the better pete thinks of me and that's great I- yeah, and then he and then he can afford a bit a bigger ring for um, Kyle. Oh, and it's already big <laughs> enough. So. <laughs> so, and if you miss me, you don't have to because you can find me every Sunday night on the Diz Unplugged podcast, Disneyland podcast, um, with my good friends Tom Bell, Nancy Johnson, Mary Jo Mulata, Willie, and Tony Spatel. And there we have a lot of fun talking about Walt's Park. So if you want to know a lot more about Disneyland and Southern California uh, or about the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco, give us a listen. We are live on Mixler on Sundays at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, Disneyland Time. And you can download our three weekly shows from iTunes on Mondays and Tuesdays. Also, if you want to listen to more about the history of Walt Disney, Uh, his Imagineers and Disneyland Uh, check out our Disneyland podcast archives for my uh, so just about three years worth of Disney history episodes and so Craig where can our listeners go to find your shows my shows your videos all that you find all of that at uh, (laughs) disunplug.com just whatever show you're looking for whether it's the Disneyland show or connecting with Walt or one of the other ones Disney World the trip uh, Universal, uh, they're all right there. Uh, that's where you find all the show notes containing links to anything you might want. I know that it's still very confusing on finding Michael's uh, history segments, the one he's put out in the past, uh, in our show notes from the last show, as well as this one. And I'll probably go back and put them in all of them. So it's simpler for everyone. Uh, we will have the link to Disboards where Tom and Carol. Michael's lovely, lovely wife, of course, uh, Mm -hmm. helped compile direct links to where you can find some of his history ones. And then, you know, we're we're still working on getting that master list of everything together. So that way it's easier for you guys to to find all these pieces out there that'll make this podcast much more enjoyable if you get a chance to listen to some of those uh, great episodes that Michael's done before. So, uh, yeah, just keep paying attention to disboards and our show notes of course at disunplug.com and you can send me messages at michael at wdwinfo.com i've gotten lots of um great messages and some good ideas for future episodes Hmm. and yes so we'll be talking about those craig um you can also find me on twitter at m bowling 121 on facebook i'm michael bowling and on instagram michael bowling the diz So thank you for making us a part of your day. And remember, I only hope that we don't lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a man, Walt Disney. Disney.